Thank you, guys. Good evening, Cross Life. It's good to see everyone. Uh, it's good to be back in the uh, pulpit preaching the Word of God to you. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the break I, uh, that you gave me. The past several weeks has been uh, just good spending time with the family. And um, uh, actually, our entire family is back there now. So I'm just, I guess you can say hi from a distance <laughs> to the baby. Um, but thank you again for the break. It was just, it was just a good time uh, getting some rest uh, and being there for uh, you know, the kids and Lucy. And, and I really miss just uh, being able to teach you guys and to uh, minister to you from here. So glad to be back. Uh, but before I begin with the preaching of God's word, I, I, did, I, I wanted to say a few words uh, about uh, Roe v. Wade uh, being overturned by the Supreme Court. Um, it's, uh, you know, first, praise God. It's, it's pretty crazy news, um, uh, what we just uh, found out this past, uh, past week. You know, one of the greatest guilt of our generation and a sin that's uh, been very heavy upon my heart uh, just for our nation is the guilt of abortion. In the Bible, it says in Psalm chapter 139, verse 13 to 14, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Again, it says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. You knitted me in my mother's womb. The life within the womb is attributed with personhood throughout the Bible. The unborn is attributed with personhood. The unborn is an image bearer of God. And the great atrocity of abortion is that it kills that life under the banner of woman's choice. That no man or woman has a choice to take the life of another except in cases of righteous judgment or defense. And the reason why the overturning of Roe v. Wade is significant is because it takes the issue of abortion back down to the level of the states. Um, you know, the NPR, it says the following, abortion is now illegal or heavily restricted in at least 11 states following the Supreme Court historic decision Friday to overturn Roe v. Wade. Twelve other states have laws in place that paved the way to quickly ban or severely restrict access to them, according to research from Guttmacher Institute, a group that favors abortion rights. Several additional states appear likely to pass new laws. So even though this isn't a full ban on abortion in our nation, hundreds of thousands of children will be saved, and that is, that is good news. Uh, that is good news. Uh, but this is also a reminder to churches that we must continue to support uh, women who are carrying their children to term to love them and to meet their needs and to empower them with hope. It's a reminder to us as a church. And with the birth of so many unwanted children, we as a church must pray that godly families will rise to adopt uh, these, uh, these children, even for some of us to consider adoption as well. Um, I don't have the time to get into all the implications surrounding the subject of life and abortion, but uh, when the school year starts... Um, because that's when all the students come back, and I want to talk about this when everybody is here. Um, I want to do a mini-series on abortion, the sanctity of life. I want to talk about fostering children, adoption. And I also want to talk about forgiveness and healing from the sin of abortion. And uh, I think the last time I talked about abortion and the sanctity of life, I think it was about four years ago. So it's about time that I uh, address this issue again. Uh, but for today, I just wanted to take some time and... Um, really direct our praise to God who has shown our nation this act of grace. Uh, God, God is good. Uh, God is good. So um, but let's remember there's, con there's still work to do um, on our part to be the salt and the light. Okay. All right, with that being said, let's get into the book of 2 Samuel. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to be doing an introduction today, but I want to read... From 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 to 17, to capture the heart of what I want to communicate today. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 to 17. Please rise as we honor the reading of God's word. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. Who shall come from your own body, from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. 
But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all of this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we know that you are the promised seed, the one who is the offspring of David. You are the son of David, whose kingdom is established for all of eternity. And God, we are blessed because you have brought us into that very kingdom by your death and your resurrection. You've given us kingdom citizenship, not by what we have done, but by the sacrifice of the son and the power of his resurrection. Lord, as we dive into the study of 2 Samuel, help us to look always to Christ and to know that the eternal kingdom will come a kingdom where there is no more pain, no more sin, no more suffering. Lord, there is no more rebellion against you. But there is peace and worship. It is a time when we will be with you for all of eternity. Set our eyes on what is to come, O oh God. And keep our hearts focused on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, today, we finally begin our study in the book of 2 Samuel. So it's been quite some time now. For those of you who've been with us in our study of 1 Samuel, you know that 1 and 2 Samuel are actually one book. It's one book. So technically, by stopping in at the end of 1 Samuel, I stopped in the middle of the story. But I felt like it was uh, nice to take a small break and get into the New Testament for a change of pace. But now that we finished the book of Galatians, I wanted to finish up what we started and it makes sense for us to begin with a reintroduction to the book of First and Second Samuel with a review of you know, some of the general background um, for the book of First and Second Samuel. And then what I want to do is I want to go through an overview of the history leading up to the book of First and Second Samuel. And then lastly, uh, do a review of the story of First Samuel so that we know where we left off. Okay? So that's the roadmap for today's message. So first, I'm going to be giving us some general background information. Second, get into history leading up to the book of Samuel. Third, a review of the story of 1 Samuel. All right? Let's get into some background information. First and Second Samuel is, is actually written as a single book in the Hebrew. It was only after it was translated into the Greek language that it was divided into two. Uh, so when you read First and Second Samuel... They're meant to be read as one book. Okay? Now, the author for the book of First and Second Samuel is unknown. We don't, we don't know who the author is. Uh, the, date was, uh, the date when it was written was sometime after the northern and southern kingdom split in two. Okay, so you know the kingdom of Israel split in two, and that happened in 931 B.C. Now, the date of events within these books take place sometime before the reign of Saul, and Saul reigned in 1051 B.C., 1051 B.C., and it goes all the way through King David's reign, which comes to an end, which came to an end in 971 B.C. Now, the purpose of the book of Samuel, and I would say this detail is very important for us to understand what the book is about, okay? The purpose of the book of Samuel is to establish Israel's monarchy in anticipation of the messianic king. That's the point. The book of Samuel is to establish Israel's monarchy in anticipation of the messianic king. Now, what I want you to realize in our study as we go through um, the message today is that the progression of the biblical narrative, starting with Genesis, throughout the establishment of the monarchy, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, is more than just a sovereign unfolding of human events. Now, underneath the historical events and the national and the individual interactions is a spiritual warfare between the powers of heaven and the powers of hell. And the book of 1 Samuel vividly captures the invisible battle behind what would otherwise seem to be a normal and natural record of a power struggle between men. So as we go through the history leading up to 1 and 2 Samuel and as we go through and review 1 Samuel again, I'm going to try to pull back the veil, um, pull back the veil so that you might be able to see the face of the devil, so to speak, and the glory of our God. And, um, and as we get into it, I want to begin by giving you guys um, 
a story, because you guys know we're doing family worship now, so we've got families in the back. Right? So we've got families in the back, I think. Um, and just as a reminder, the reason why we do family worship as a church during the summer is so that our children can see um, the parents, their parents worship God. And that together as a family, they can receive the word of God and to learn together. And so, you know, obviously, you know, some of them are going to cry. Uh, some of them are going to just, you know, be very antsy. Uh, and, you know, when that happens, and it seems, and it's going to be like, it's going to be a bit of a distraction. But it's a reminder to us that our church is filled with families, right? When I think about the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus Christ preached, <laughs> there are probably kids crying and everything. Um, but this is good for us to be able to focus and to pay attention to the word of God, even when there might be distractions around us. And as uh, Matt has uh, reminded us, if you see a family struggling with their kids, offer to help, right? Offer to help and uh, uh, to, to make things a bit easier for them. All right? Good? Okay, so let me see where our kids are at. Okay, we've got a couple of kids there. Okay, we've got, we've got kids over there. All right. So, a long time ago, in ages past, time immemorial, okay, there was a dragon that roamed across the lands, a dragon that ravaged the earth. Ravage just means destroy, okay? <laughs> Destroying the things in this world. And he would spew out fire from his mouth and smoke would rise from his nostrils. But then there was an old man, an old man, a puppet master, yeah, he was a puppet master who decided to slay the dragon. And from a tree that grew out from the earth, he fashioned for himself a puppet, a life-size puppet. It was large. A life-size puppet made after his own image. A gardener, because the man liked the garden. And the puppet master, he had a seed. He had a seed touched by the powers of heaven. And he took that seed and he put it in the chest of the puppet. And the puppet came to life. It came to life, and it was animated, and it went forth to slay the dragon. But because this puppet was a gardener, it had no means to fight a dragon, as you would imagine. And so the dragon spewed out fire, and it consumed the puppet, and engulfed it in flames, and reduced it to a pile of ashes. But that seed, that seed, it remained unscathed, pristine, meaning that it was almost as if it did not get burned. Okay, that's what it means. Okay? It means untouched. It means normal. It wasn't destroyed. It was intact. It means, that means it is still there. Okay? It is still there. And amazingly, that seed, it budded, and it became a little sprout. And then it grew, and it became a sapling. And then it grew, and it became a giant oak. And that oak took shape and became another puppet. But this time, not a gardener. It became a sailor. And the sailor sought to trick the dragon into the waters to drown it. And so it led it away from shores. It embarked out from the land upon a great and giant ark. So he went forth. And the dragon followed. But to the demise and the despair, or to, to the despair of the sailor, he saw that this giant reptile was able to swim. Was able to swim. And again, the dragon spewed fire from its mouth and engulfed the puppet in flames and reduced it to a pile of ashes and the wind scattered it across the face of the ocean. But the seed again remained unscathed and pristine. This is going to increase your vocabulary, okay? Pristine and unscathed. And again, it took shape into another puppet, this time a traveler. I don't know why, but it became a traveler. And it was again consumed and burned to ashes. And so it became, again, the seed became a king. In fact, it became a warrior king. But even then, it was no match for the dragon. And then finally, the seed grew and took on the shape that was different from its past forms. It grew into a lamb. The seed grew into a lamb. And immediately, it seemed as if the match was over before it ever begun. Because how can a lamb destroy a dragon? How can it destroy a dragon? And like always, the dragon spewed fire, spewed fire, and engulfed the lamb in fire. And the puppet was burned to a crisp. And the lamb laid lifeless on the floor with a skin charred as black as night. But the winds from the east 
blew and it carried away the ashes, exposing something underneath the burnt surface. There was a glisten, a shine, a glimmer. Under the likeness of charred wooden flesh was gold. It was gold. The lamb rose from its ashes in a glory never before seen. And the dragon saw this and it freaked out. And I freaked out. It was scared. And it stepped back. And again, it spewed fire from its mouth, but this time with temperatures as hot as hell. But the gold would not melt because it was some kind of alloy, higher melting point. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the lamb made its way to the dragon for the final showdown, but there was no epic battle. There was no prolonged struggle. Just a one-sided massacre. The lamb, it moved with the power and the speed of a lion. It was nothing like it. A lion. And it struck a deadly blow against the dragon and gave it a most shameful death. A shameful death. You know how it killed the dragon? It sat on it. it sat on it and the weight of the gold crushed the head. You know how embarrassing it is to die by having somebody sit on you? It is shameful. It is shameful. And all those who beheld the glorious victory not only rejoiced, but they laughed at the dragon's demise. You guys get the point of the story? Okay. Let me break it down. Kids, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Okay, that's the point in the story. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he came into this world and he seemed harmless. And the dragon is the devil. And the dragon, in fact, he killed Jesus. He crucified Jesus upon a cross by manipulating the men around him crucified Jesus Christ. By killing Jesus Christ, he thought he won. But actually, by killing Jesus Christ, he ended up losing. Why? Because when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, his blood washed away our sins. It washed away our sins. And because his blood washed away our sins, it cleansed us from all the wrong things that we had done. The devil cannot accuse us of anything wrong. And he cannot drag us down with him to hell. He lost. It was almost like his head getting crushed. And three days later, when Jesus Christ, after Jesus Christ died, he resurrected from the dead. And it says he resurrected in glory, outshined light. And the Bible says in the future, Jesus Christ is actually going to fight the devil. And he is going to beat him up once and for all and fulfill the finished work of crushing his head. Now for the parents... Let me go a little bit deeper okay, to the meaning of the story. May those who have ears hear. Okay. Look into the history leading up to the book of Samuel. I'm going to get into, um, as I get into this history, children, you can ask your parents to explain the story I shared with you a little more. Okay? Get into a little more of the details. The story in 1st and 2nd Samuel begins all the way to the book of Genesis and the fall of mankind. When God created humanity, he made... Male, them male and female, and made them after his own image. And he blessed them to enjoy the fruits of the Garden of Eden. But there was one command of forbiddance. They were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But there was a fallen angel, a creature of power, who despised the creator. But because the triune God cannot be harmed, he cannot even be touched, the devil sought to do the next best thing, and that is to come after the image bearers of God, to destroy those who shared in the likeness of the divine. And so the devil in the form of a serpent deceived Eve and effectively Adam into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And their transgression ushered in the power of sin and death, corrupting the nature of man, marring the image of God, dulling the glory of the divine, and destining mankind for damnation. The corruption of man in the beginning in Genesis was an assault against God. And the origin of the fall, you have to realize, was demonic. The origin of the fall was demonic. And it's critical for us to see that the fall in Genesis chapter 3 didn't just stop there. The devil continued to work. He continued to resist and he continued to rebel. To make sure that the work of deception would lead to damnation for the Adamic race. And the reason why the devil worked so hard is because at the moment of the fall, right after the fall, God made a promise to undo the work of the devil. To bring about redemption. And he would do it by offering mankind the promise of a seed, a seed. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Between your offspring 
and her offspring. Literally, between your seed and her seed. A descendant from the line of Eve, a child of Adam, will come and strike a mortal blow against the devil, crushing his head, undoing the work of the fall. The hope of the gospel, the good news of redemption, was given to mankind. And the devil sought to destroy that hope. In the story of Genesis, this hope of life, the hope of a seed, it continued through the generations with Seth, the son of Adam. And then Noah, the descendant of Seth. So it just continued. The promise of the seed continued throughout the generations. And in the days of Noah, we have a record of some bizarre activity on the part of demonic powers. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And they took as their wives, and they took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. They were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. The demons in the Bible are known by various names and titles. Here in Genesis chapter 6, they are called the sons of God. In the book of Daniel, they are called watchers. In Psalm 82, they are collectively called the divine council. And they're even called, you'll find in the Bible, they're called gods with the lowercase g, of course. They're created beings, but still called gods. <laughs> Elohim in the Hebrew. And here in Genesis 6, we see that the corruption of mankind was not enough for the sons of God. In order to further assault the image of God in man, the powers of hell interbred with the daughters of man to give birth to a hybrid monstrosity, demigods known as the Nephilim. These creatures were, in a way, image bearers of the devil. It was a cheap copy. They were men of extraordinary stature. They were giants who walked among men. And the evil that had begun in Genesis chapter 3 just spiraled out of control so that God even looked upon his creation with sorrow. He grieved over the creation of his image bearers. So the warfare between the powers of heaven and hell are hot. And I want you to always see that. Not just the natural events that unfold, but the battle between heaven and hell. Now, God in his power wiped away the corruption of the devil with the flood and preserved the promise of a seed through Noah. And he passed on the hope of redemption through Noah's offspring, Shem. And from Shem came Abraham, the father of Israel. And, Abra and to Abraham, God made a promise in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17 to 18. It says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your seed or your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring, your seed, shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Again, the promise of Genesis chapter 3 is reiterated. An offspring shall come, a seed shall come, a descendant who shall overcome the defenses of the enemies. He will possess the gates of his enemies. He will crush the head of the serpent. And from Abraham came Isaac, and from Isaac came Jacob. And Jacob had 12 children, the 12 children who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And to one of his sons, Judah, Jacob pronounced the blessing. In Genesis chapter 49, 8 through 10, it says, Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He, stood, he stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. See, the seed that's going to possess the gates of his enemies, the seed that's going to crush the head of the serpent, that seed would become, would be a king, a Judean king to whom all the people will bow. This was the promise that continued on. But the devil will continue to resist. So the demons once again 
left their proper abode and interbred with the daughters of men and gave birth once again to the Nephilim. The Nephilim were divided up into multiple tribes, including the Raphaim, the Anakim, and the Amorites. And they inhabited the lands of Canaan so that the giants once again walked among men. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 33, it says, And there, were, there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. We looked small. We looked like grasshoppers. We looked like insects compared to these giants, the sons of Anak, descendants of the Nephilim. But this time, instead of purging the land with demonic, instead of purging the land of the demonic spawns with the flood, God chose to sweep them away with a sword. The nation of Israel, the national son of God, would wage war against the sons of the gods. And the imager of Yahweh would go toe-to-toe with the images of Lucifer. And so after their deliverance from Egypt, Israel conquered the giant tribes of Nephilim, including the kingdom of Bashan, whose king was Og, a descendant of the Raphaim. Like the flood, the sword of Israel left left none to survive. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 3 to 4, it says, So the Lord our God gave into our hand Og, also the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we struck him down until he had no survivors left. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city that we did not take from them. Sixty cities, the whole region of Argob, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. But in the days of Joshua, when Israel was commanded to conquer the pagan nations and to entirely obliterate the demonic remnant, they instead grew complacent, and they spared their enemies so that some of the descendants of the Nephilim, they took refuge safely within the Philistines' territory of Gath. In Joshua chapter 11, verse 21 to 22, it says, And Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, and from Debir, and from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath and in Ashdod did some remain. So some of, the, some of the Anakim, the descendants of the Nephilim, resided in the city of Gath and Ashdod, the territory of the Philistines. Now after Joshua died, the devil took advantage of Israel's disobedience and pushed back. The nations who were spared by Israel became their oppressors and they subjugated the people of God. And even though God delivered his people through prophets known as the judges, the demonic influence of the pagan nations led the Israelites into perversity and ignorance so that they became seeped in really bizarre, bizarre behavior and contradictory, uh, contradictory beha- behavior. They were basically like sheep without a shepherd. They did whatever was right in their own eyes. And the history of redemption progressed to a point that a king was now needed to push back against the demonic forces, to take back the people of God for God. It was time for the promise of the sea to take greater shape. In Judges chapter 17, verse 1 through 6, it says, it gives this story. And just to help you understand how perverse things were in the times of the judges. It says, there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, blessed be my, blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord Yahweh from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and a household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They did whatever they wanted to do. They did whatever was right in their own eyes, what they perceived to be correct. There was no king in those days. They needed a king to lead them down the straight path. And so we come to the book of Samuel. Samuel was the last judge, chosen by God to anoint the first king of Israel, king to deliver his people from her enemies and to lead them down the path of righteousness. But instead of of waiting for the Lord to induct the first king, a seed from the line of Judah, because that's where the king was supposed to come, the people of Israel wanted a king like the other nations. It says in 1 Samuel 8, verse 5, 
Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want to be like the pagan nations around us. Appoint for us a king who will judge us. And I believe in the act of judgment, the Lord gave the Israelites what they wanted, a man who would judge them like the other nations. And so Samuel anointed Saul, a man from the tribe of Benjamin. And he started off well. The man was jealous for God. He was excited for the things of the Lord. He rose up to defeat the enemies of Israel, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines. But on two critical occasions, Saul failed to obey God, the second of which we find in chapter 15. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, the Lord called Saul to destroy the Amalekites. And the Amalekites, like the Amorites and the Raphaim and the Anakim, were descendants of the Nephilim, a remnant of the offspring of demons. It's for this reason why God called Saul to completely annihilate these people, destroy them. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3 says, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. Wipe out the nation of this demonic clan. See, this wasn't just a matter of international conquest, but spiritual subjugation and judgment against the powers of hell. And it was the king, the representative of Yahweh, who was to wield the sword of judgment and to purge the land of promise from the influence and the perversions of the devil. He was to fulfill what was entrusted to the Israelites since the death of Joshua, the eradication of the Nephilim. But then in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 7 through 9, it says the following. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. He didn't wipe everything away. In complete disobedience, Saul rejected the word of God like the Israelites in the times of the judges. He did whatever was right in his own eyes. Things didn't change. The man was oblivious to the generational conflict between heaven and hell that extended beyond the political and international upheavals of his days. Right? He wasn't thinking about the hostility of the devil against God and against the image bearers of God. He wasn't mindful of the deception of the woman, the corruption of creation, the condemnation of humanity. He wasn't thinking about the hope of the promise that God would bring about redemption through the Adamic line. When he spared Agag, it wasn't just a matter of the king deciding to spare the life of another. It was a matter of God's representative making a peace treaty with the son of a devil. It was an act of betrayal. It was a Judas kiss. And when confronted with this disobedience, Saul tried to justify his behavior. In verse 21, it says, But the people took up the spoil, the sheep, and the oxen, the best, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. I didn't destroy everything because I wanted to devote these things to God. It was for Yahweh, for the glory of the divine king. And so it says in chapter 15, verse 22 to 23 of 1 Samuel, And Samuel said, Has the Lord... Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as sin as divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. In verse 28 it says, And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. But the Lord did more than just reject Saul from being king. You see, by choosing to spare Agag, Saul practically aligned himself with demonic powers. So God saw it fit to deliver him over to those very entities. Saul would no longer be a vessel for the spirit of God, but a vessel for the gods. No longer the royal regent of Yahweh, but the pawn of hell. And so immediately after his rejection, it says in 1 Samuel Chapter 16, verse 14 to 15. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. This is nothing less than demonic oppression. This is an oppression that begins to look no different from the New Testament records of possession. As the story unfolds, Saul becomes erratic. He becomes unstable, deranged, murderous. He becomes paranoid seeking to kill his own son and slaughtering the priests of God. He was given over to demonic powers to which he had mercy. But in the place of Saul, the Lord chose for himself a man after his own heart, a young boy by the name of David, 
a boy from the line of Judah. This is the one from whom the Lord will fulfill the promise of a king who will possess the gates of his enemies and crush the head of the serpent. So upon his anointing, the Lord actually uses David to cast out the demon, the harmful spirit that was plaguing Saul. And he would do it with words of truth accompanied by the melody of his lyre. David would do what Saul would not, and that is engage in the battles against hell. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, it says, And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. This is the closest thing that we have to an exorcism in the Old Testament. And from here, we come to chapter 17 where we come across the most famous story, the story of David and Goliath. From the land of the Philistines, there was a champion warrior, a giant standing nine feet and nine inches tall, a man who has shed blood and taken life ever since he was a youth. He was from the city of Gath, the very city where the Nephilim took refuge in the days of Joshua. Goliath was a remnant of the giant clans, a descendant of the demigods, a son of the devil. And as he stood mocking the nation of Israel in contempt against the living God, David said the following in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And with five stones he took, he stood before the giant and spoke these famous words. In verse 45 to 47, he said to, he said to them, you come to me with a sword. And with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And then David, man, this young boy, just ran down the valley of Elah and put his hand into the bag, took out a stone and slung it. And the rock made contact with Goliath, piercing his forehead. An invincible, seemingly invincible giant just crashed down to the ground. And David went over to the limp body, took Goliath's own sword and decapitated his head. And the rest of the Philistines fled in fear of the one that God has chosen to be the king of the nation of Israel. But the story of David's rise to the throne would not be so smooth and simple. The devil who operated behind the powers of the other nations to oppress the nation of Israel from the outside would now work to destroy it from the inside. A jealousy, you see, possessed Saul as he saw the rising fame of David. And that untethered sin became a platform for the devil to move and to manipulate the king's heart. You have to remember that deep and dark sins invites dark powers. You have to realize that. You cannot be naive of how the devil operates. Deep and dark, unrepentant sins that you continue to indulge over and over again invites dark powers. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 to 27, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Sin is the handmaiden of the devil left unattended. She will unlash the lock to your soul and invite her master to make his dwelling within your heart. And so Saul's jealousy and hatred opened the door to demonic possession. And the harmful spirit that had at one time departed at the songs of God rooted itself deeply within Saul's soul because sin deafened his ears to the melodic tunes of Yahweh. And so he became mad, overcome with murder and paranoia. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 10 through 11, it says, The next day a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, and he did as he did day by day. Saul had a spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. A number of times Saul tried to kill David, first conniving behind the scenes, then through spurious and unpredictable acts of rage, and then in open intent, shameless intent to kill. For Saul, it was a matter of securing political power and ensuring the extension of the Sauline dynasty. But for the devil, it was a matter of killing the hope of redemption, to cut off the line of the seed. But with every assault, the Lord providentially delivered or he miraculously intervened until finally Saul was delivered over to the hands of the Philistines. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 3 to 7, it says, The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him. 
He was badly wounded by the archers. And Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. And with that death, the path was paved to the throne. David would rise as new king, the promised king of God. He was a man who would obey God's voice, a man after God's own heart, the king from the tribe of Judah, a warrior who would not be overcome but one who would subjugate his enemies, a giant killer who opposed the spawns of the devil and purified the lands with the flood of his military might. It was from this man, King David, that God would propel the hope of the seed who would rise up in his likeness, a son of David, a seed of Abraham who will possess the gates of his enemies, the seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. And so God, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, makes a covenant with David. And it says this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 to 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lay down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring, your seed after you. Who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And it is in fulfillment of this promise from the line of the royal Judean blood that the Son of God is born. And he comes to bring a full frontal assault against the kingdom of darkness, against the demonic dominions. Exercising demons not with the melodic songs of a liar, but by direct commands, by divine proclamation. And he would stand not in the valley to kill a Nephilim, a son of a god, but kill the god of the world himself, not to decapitate his head with a sword, but to crush it with the cross, possessing the gates of his enemies. And those who have been enchained by sin, held captive by the devil, will be released through the channel of faith, delivered from the domain of darkness, and brought into the kingdom of light. A kingdom invisible to our eyes now, but in times unknown, a kingdom that will be revealed for a thousand years. And then fully established for all of eternity in a new heavens and a new earth. With the old creation purged by the fire of divine judgment. David was chosen to carry this line of promise. The story of 2 Samuel that we're going to cover. The book we're going to study is to make it very clear to us that David is not that seed. It's going to make it very clear to us that David is not the promised seed. In many ways, David fulfills the qualities of Old Testament prophecies. He is a warrior who stands up against the powers of darkness. He is a man after God's own heart, chosen from the tribe of Judah to establish the kingdom of God. But in 2 Samuel, we come to see David's weaknesses. We see his moral failures, failures in committing adultery and murder. We see his unwillingness to exact justice, his inability to hold his kingdom together. We see his pride, which results in the judgment of his own people. As extraordinary as David was, David could not save himself, let alone save others. Salvation had to come from another seed. It's not David who is the seed, but the one who is the son of David. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the lamb who has slain the dragon. So as we begin our study in the book of 2 Samuel, my hope and my prayer is that we would be regularly looking to Christ. Always looking to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the final fulfillment of the Davidic line. And we set our eyes beyond the kingdom that we read about here, but a kingdom that is to be revealed, a kingdom in which we participate now. My hope is that we don't look to things that are just right in front of us, but that we have an eternal perspective waiting for the day when the king will come to judge, when the king will come to bring us home. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for our time uh, in the study of your word, just reviewing um, just reviewing your plan of redemption, beginning with Genesis, and studying how the book of First and Second Samuel falls into your plan and how everything is ultimately fulfilled in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for what you have done upon the cross, Lord, that you perished and you bled so that we might be forgiven of our sins. You died upon the cross and you resurrected to defeat the very powers who orchestrated your death in the first place. And God, we long for the day when you will return and you will establish the final stage of your kingdom and we will be with you for all of eternity. 
May we live not for the things that are right before us, but may we live for what is to come in eternity future. Thank you, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.